Okay. Well, then let's get going with uh, the story on co-ops. Uh, let me tell you first of all about the books that, that I was able to use to put this story together. Uh, there's quite a bit in the history of Maine that, that was published in 71. Uh, I'll leave that here on the table with uh, the section on cooperatives uh, uh, designated in here. Uh, then there was a book called The Finnish Imprint that was put out, uh, I think, uh, in the bicentennial year, which discusses the Finns in, in New England, and there's quite a bit on cooperatives in, in that book, which uh, I was able to fall back on. Uh, then there's also a book called Maynard Weavers, that was published uh, in 41, which discusses the Maynard Co-op. Uh, it was written by the publicity director who, of that time, his name was Frank Alden, and, and uh, it really goes into a lot of detail, and there's some nice pictures in here, so you might want to uh, just glance through it if you like. And then in uh, 1957, when the Co-op was 50 years old, uh, they published this booklet, and uh, this also has a lot of information. But uh, before we get into the main United Cooperative Society, uh, let's talk about some of the others. Uh, what is a cooperative? Uh, the Consumers Cooperative Movement looks back to Rochdale, England, uh, 1844, when a group of uh, weavers, at obviously a, a woolen or a cotton mill there, got together, pooled their money, and uh, they bought a stock of flour and oatmeal and butter and sugar, things they needed. And that was the beginning of the standardized cooperative movement. And it spread from there uh, very slowly, but very definitely to all of Europe. And then the Europeans brought it over here when they came. Uh, the principles which the Rochdale pioneers followed have remained the guides of cooperatives ever since. And these principles are the following. Let me just go through them. Open membership means that anybody can join who believes in the principles of democratic control and mutual aid. No one is barred from membership because of the color of his skin, uh, national origin, the church he attends, or the political party. Uh, neutrality in race, religion, and politics, which is practically the same thing. Democratic control, and here's where the co-op differs from uh, other societies. Each member has one vote regardless of how many shares he owns. In other words, if you buy shares on the market today uh, in a company, you have as many votes as you have shares. But in a cooperative, it's one member, one vote, no matter how many shares you own. And the <coughs> limited interest is paid on that share capital. It's a fair interest, but it's not there to entice you to try to make money. The co-op always sold their shares for five dollars, and uh, it paid a five percent, five percent uh, uh, a year usually. But uh, there was a limit. You could own two hundred, uh, four hundred, no, forty shares, I believe, forty shares total uh, per person. Uh, patronage refunds are paid on the purchases. There are no profits. So at the end of the year, the savings for the year after deductions for operating costs and taxes and reserves and other such things, they're then distributed back to the customer on the basis of the purchase. And supposedly, one of the rules was cash sales at market prices. They were not supposed to inflate the prices just so that they could give you a nice patronage refund at the end of the year. It's not like uh, Macy's and, and Filene's who put a price on something and then sell it on sale for the rest of the rest of the year. You're not supposed to do that. It's supposed to be a fair price, and uh, uh, sales on credit are not to be permitted. Uh, credit unions are cooperatives that are organized to help members with loans when they need money. But the, the co-op, the, the, the grocery business, or whatever business it is, is not supposed to sell on credit. But we'll find out as we get into these co-ops that that didn't always hold true. Uh, and constant education. The members must be informed about their business and about the cooperative movement in general. And non-members must also be shown the advantages of the cooperative way. 
And then finally, continuous expansion. A co-op must not stand still, it must move ahead always, providing more and better service for more people. So those are the, those are the precepts. And now as we talk about these cooperatives, we'll find out which precepts they didn't follow and what happened to them. Now, the first cooperative in Maynard was organized as something called the Sovereigns of Industry on December 21st, 1875 by a group of English and Scottish textile workers here. They had obviously heard about cooperatives from their native land or maybe had even had experience in a, in a cooperative in their hometown and uh, they formed a buying club to begin with. They'd go to Boston, pick up the groceries and uh, then bring them back here and deliver them to the members with, by wheelbarrow. Uh, so it, wasn't, it was not a, a store at the beginning. But after three years, uh, they were able to uh, amass enough money and members uh, to incorporate. And uh, they call themselves the Riverside Cooperative Association. There were 16 men at the beginning who signed the incorporation papers, and they had $1,500 to start that first store. Uh, they opened the store first in the basement of what is now the Eagles Building, on the corner of Mason and Summer. And from there, after they got to be a little stronger, they moved to Riverside Hall, which is where Gruber's is now, next to the river. Uh, now, whether they call themselves Riverside Cooperative because they were next to the river or whether they had dreamt this name up before they moved, we don't know. Uh, in 1882, that's after only, what, seven years of existence, they bought land on the corner of Summer and Mason, where the Knights of Columbus Hall is now, uh, and uh, they had a, uh, a drive to get money from the people in town and to get more members, and for $15,000 they put up a three-story building uh, with the store downstairs in the basement uh, facing Mason Street and then rooms and halls above. And this became known as Cooperative Hall, uh, and it turned out to be uh, a very important building in Maynard history. Town meetings were held there, all sorts of concerts and, and socials were held there. Uh, it was a very important building. Capital stock was increased to $5,000 and the townspeople uh, gave, uh, lent them $12,000 to build the store and <coughs> the building stocked the store. And so uh, in 1903, when we get to some numbers, they are the largest grocer in town with 400 members, and they're paying rebates from 2 to 8% annually. Uh, in 1906, they plan to uh, uh, build, they, they buy some land from Lucas Brooks, or they intend to, uh, on Summer Street to put up some stables, because uh, uh, they now have stables right next to the, to the hall, and they could use that land to enlarge. And in 1907, the rebate is the highest ever, 10%. I gave back 10% in 1907. Well, let's leave this Riverside group there to bask in the sunlight of their success. Uh, meanwhile, other nationalities had been pouring into Maynard. And in 1899, a Finnish group, uh, a small group truly, organized a store. Uh, Mr. Alton in, uh, in this Maynard Weaver's book uh, he's kind of a poetic writer. He describes the, the situation such, he says, uh, was organized by a small group who were groping to find an outlet for self-expression <laughs> under the influence of Finland's wave of cooperative interest, then spreading like wildfire throughout Scandinavia. Well, I don't know if that's quite true, but uh, they had uh, $5 shares and they were able to collect $800 from the people. Uh, they believed in one vote per member, but otherwise, they weren't too, they didn't uh, uh, adhere to the cooperative principles very easily, particularly the one about credit. And uh, pretty soon, after a couple of years, uh, activity uh, kind of disintegrated because of dissensions crept into their ranks, and they finally sold it to a private operator. And uh, the, some of the people uh, who started that still were some of the early, the Finns who got here earliest, uh, some of the Huikaris, uh, Becca Beckala, Toby Saisa, uh, Victor Salminen, and uh, Amatson. Uh, these were the people who, who were, act in, were influential in starting it. 
in the next two decades, I'm going to jump a little bit and uh, take care of two more attempts. Uh, one was made by the Russians, who started a co-op which lasted a couple of years. And then uh, the Polish started one. Uh, they called it the International Cooperative Association because they had also some Lithuanians and, and a few Russians in the, in the group. Uh, and they, that started in 1911 in the Higgins Block on Main Street next to the Methodist Church, that building that's way down there. And after some initial difficulties, however, everything seemed to be in order by 1915. Uh, in 1918, they moved to the Masonic Block. And uh, then in 1920, they added a bakery in a house on Great Road, 120 Great Road. You know that house that's, uh, well, when Percival Street comes into Great Road, the, the next house there, it's kind of a narrow, and it's right up to the sidewalk. On the left or right? On the left, on the left. Going, going towards Great Road, on the left? Uh, going on right. towards uh, on Great Sudbury. Road. On Great Road, going towards the Baltic. Yeah, on the right. Left. Yeah, on the left. Uh, there's a big building there. Martin French lived there for a while. <laughs> okay. Oh, Crystal. Oh, okay. All right, well, then let's not get stuck to it. Look at 120 when you go by next time. I, I, I know. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, about the time that the uh, main history was written, the ovens were still in there. Uh, I don't know that it's actually in the house building. I, I drove by today, and there's, some, there's a couple of buildings out back, too. I don't know whether the ovens were out there or, or in the actual house, but uh, nevertheless, that's where they had a bakery. Uh, but uh, uh, they also went into this business of credit, because it was very difficult in the town of Maine at that time, because the mill would be up and the mill would be down. Uh, in one year, I think it was 1908 or two, I, I can't remember the exact year, but uh, when the mill was really down, that Riverside Co-op rebate was the only money in town coming into the people's pocket for that one little season when the mill was really down. And so the, I don't know what happened here, but uh, everybody used to take, get credit in all these co-ops. Uh, that was the way things worked. And uh, at the height of the Depression, this cooperative just went on to, because of overextended credit. And uh, according to the Maynard book, uh, Jacob Sowitz, if you remember Sowitz's market, who was working there as an employee, uh, bought the business. They had an auction and he bought the business uh, and started to operate it. Now, let's get back to uh, the time around the, right after the turn of the century. And uh, that was the founding of this Finnish cooperative that we're celebrating tonight with all these pictures. It was called a Kaleva, a Kaleva. Uh, they named these things uh, by, by words that they took from, from Finland, uh, Kaleva being the, uh, uh, a very important section of their, their heritage. Uh, all these societies that were here in Maine, there was already a temperance society, Finnish temperance society. There were two churches, uh, well no, there was one church, the Lutheran church at that time. And, uh, uh, there was a socialist club in town, and all of these societies took a took a strange name, a name that meant something to them from uh, from Finnish uh, heritage, and and called their organization by that. Then they had a sports team, and they'd call the sports team by that name. They'd have a band, and they call the band by some such name. So you you have a whole pile of names that really confuse the historians now. Believe me. <laughs> uh, they started talking about this, this idea of founding a cooperative in the sauna, in the steam baths that were on River Street. Uh, I always, when I read this in the years past, I always had a picture of all these naked guys sitting in the sauna uh, <laughs> talking about pooling their money and starting a cooperative. But uh, I think it was this guy in this book uh, pointed out that it was not the naked guys in the sauna, but it was the people out in the waiting room who were waiting their turn who had uh, nothing to do but to, uh, to discuss things like this. So they started uh, uh, to sell shares, uh, go around and spread it, and by January of 1907, they had 187 Finnish names, uh, people who had put down $5 a piece uh, to become charter members of this cooperative. And as I look at the names, 
I discovered that they came from right across the, the whole town. It didn't matter uh, whether the person belonged to whatever organization. They were, they were, they were all there at the beginning. Uh, they have uh, got going. Uh, they appointed Maddie Heckler as their first uh, manager and uh, Becca Beckler as their first treasurer. Beckler and Heckler, it sounds like a vaudeville tree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, that was, it was kind of a vaudeville kind of show when they got going. They, they got their money and they went out and they, some guy had just run his store into the ground, so they went and they bought his, his supplies and his fixtures. And since it wasn't far away, uh, on a Monday morning, the people that weren't working went down. They carried all this stuff across the street and they put it in, into uh, the store, which then turned out to be the, the co-op in Maine uh, uh, after all those years. Uh, they took one little section of that store that they rented, and there's some pictures around, uh, and I'll have some here too, of what that place looked like. It was not, not very fancy, I believe you. Uh, Originally, they had, in these discussions in the steam bath, they had uh, hoped that they could join the Riverside Cooperative, which was at its strongest. So they went over there and uh, inquired about, couldn't they become members if the Riverside would hire one Finnish clerk, or two Finnish clerks, whatever it took for the hours they were open, to take care of these people. And the Riverside Cooperative stuffed them off, they were not interested, uh, which they might have done already to the, to the other groups as they came along, I don't know. But uh, uh, they were doing fine, they didn't need these foreigners coming in, so uh, the offer was refused. Uh, in any case, the next ten to eight to ten years of the, the co-op down there on Main Street was rather experimental because they didn't have any business knowledge. Uh, the membership didn't really understand what co-ops were all about uh, to begin with, and many of them just thought it was a charitable agency to which you went and you, you kind of get your groceries and, and signed your name, and uh, then under capitalization, debts, many bad accounts, and so forth, and they just brought them to the point where they couldn't hire a capable manager. They just didn't have the money to, to even go out and look for somebody who was capable. And so they went through managers, the one after another, uh, all trying their best, I guess, but uh, not getting very far. Uh, now, I'd like to vary a little. This brings me to Ken Olson's comments. You remember when he was here a couple of years ago at that meeting uh, up at the high school and later at the one at the mill? He made the, uh, the point that Maine it was a communist town. Uh, so uh, let me clarify his Partially true statement, but uh, a definitely warped statement. There was a large part of the, the membership of this cooperative uh, were from the Socialist Club. Uh, there was a, a whole pile of these young Finns that came over. Uh, their, their home country was filled with all kinds of political winds that were sweeping in from, from Russia and from Germany and from all around. Uh, and they were very few in number, but they were very zealous in their beliefs and their principles. And so they had uh, uh, formed a group, I think there were only 10 or 12 of them, but they were wise enough to invite into this, into this basic political core all those people who were interested in other things, such as the band, the, uh, the Imitra, there's that word, Imitra band here in Maine, uh, was a freelancer at the time, and so they were invited to come down there, given some, some uh, uh, offer of assistance uh, financially. Uh, the, the sports people were invited to form all kinds of teams, and uh, so we have uh, pictures of, of uh, all sorts of things along those lines. Uh, also, people who were interested in dramatics particularly, uh, were invited down there, and so by 1907, 1908, they're putting on big productions in various halls around town that they rent. Uh, the sports teams are out. They're particularly great believers in calisthenics and in the uh, in the European manner. And so pretty soon they have a, a great number of people uh, that are uh, 
available. Now, let me just read to you something which uh, probably I'll get that, get that town just a little bit uh, involved. Uh, this is from a newspaper, Maine News, of 1907, January 25, 1907. And the headline is, Officials Look On, Socialistic Red Flags Flaunted in Maine by the Finns. Uh, the people of Maine were given quite a surprise Tuesday evening shortly after supper when a parade passed up Main Street, headed by the Imatra Band, after which came several hundred Finnish-speaking people, comprising both men and women, all of whom waved small red flags, carried red banners, and waved red torches. For, the, for a time, the townspeople, who were not wise to what was going on, almost thought the town was being invaded by a revolutionary army. But when the stars and stripes were seen floating on ahead, their fears were allayed, and a curious crowd followed the parade back to Cooperative Hall, where hundreds of the Finnish people joined in to take part in the entertainment which commemorated the Bloody Sunday in Russia, when a large number of people were shot down by the Tsar's troops uh, be because they came to his palace to ask for bread. So uh, these Finns here in Maine are showing sympathy to something that happened in Russia. Uh, it certainly was a successful meeting as planned by the local society of Maynard, and the big crowd was certainly in a frame of mind to do things to the Russian government or anybody else <laughs> after listening to the speakers. And it lists, lists the speakers, and it says the rest of the program consisted of songs by Miss Ida Kielinen, who has an exceptionally good voice, and then poetry by so forth, so forth. Over $80 was cleared, and a part of this is to be sent to Russia to help the sufferers of the recent revolutions, and part to Caldwell, Idaho, to help the trial expenses of two men now in prison charged with being implicated in the murder of ex-Governor Stunnenberg of that state. Uh, so when you read the, uh, when you read the, the notebooks, uh, minutes of their meetings, uh, you discover that at every meeting there's always a request from some usually out in the Midwest or out in the western part of the state where the union movement was very active, uh, there's always a request for aid uh, because somebody has been jailed or somebody has been beaten or somebody has been murdered so forth. And then they always send five dollars or whatever they can afford to these things. So it was a very compatible uh, sort of uh, organization uh, trying to take care of things all around the country and obviously around the world. Uh, let me go on then. Uh, since the cooperative way was sort of a middle road between capitalism and socialism, uh, they had an allegiance, these main socialists, almost a fanatical attachment for their cooperative. And they worked and they sacrificed with the conviction that they were building a better society where mutual aid, democratic fellowship, and economic equality and brotherhood would be realized. Now, in 1916, the society was fortunate enough to procure the services of a gentleman named Waldemar Niemela, whose competent guidance led to substantial gains. Here's the first professional manager that they had. The first move was the establishment of a meat department to the store. They had, to, had obviously not sold meat. Meat was bought from some some uh, local butcher. And then the organization of a restaurant on the second floor of the building. Uh, most of the Finns in town were young and unmarried and working in the mill and needed a good place to eat. The local boarding houses left something to be desired and so for the next dozen years or so the cooperative restaurant up on that second floor fed as many as 250 diners per day, three meals. Three meals. Uh, here's an ad in the paper. At the United Cooperative Society's dining hall, you can board for the week or get single meals. Ladies, $6.25 a week. Gentlemen, $6.50 a week. <laughs> single meals, 50 cents. And so they did that for uh, as I said, for quite a few years, and then the only reason they canceled it was because all of these young people by now had married and had homes, and they weren't 
going out to eat anymore. They were eating at home. So uh, in the, uh, later in the 20s, uh, they closed that aspect of the cooperative down. Uh, they had bought the building, the whole co-op building, uh, in 1912 on a time payment, payment plan. Uh, also, in 1914, they bought some land on Powder Mill Road, uh, on the corner of Douglas and Powder Mill Road, where the, uh, what, what's it called? The, what? Jiffy Lube. Yeah, Jiffy Lube is right now. They bought some land there, and they built some housing, or some, they put up some couple of little buildings for a small branch store and a bakery. Now, uh, Originally, a private baker had always provided this, the, the, the stuff for them, uh, which was, to be understood, probably expensive, and but was worse, uh, poor in quality. And so the uh, men had tried to talk to the other Finnish cooperatives in Massachusetts, uh, because wherever there was a Finn town, there were cooperatives. And uh, by that time, there were probably uh, six or seven cooperatives going rather strongly in places like Fitchburg and Worcester and Quincy and Norwood and Maynard. And to see if they couldn't build a, a bakery together that would service them all. But obviously this was too early, too early in time uh, to uh, get any action on that. So uh, they decided to start a bakery on their own. And uh, they put it into that building on Powder Mill Road. Uh, the bakery was out back and out front. They had a bakery counter, and then they used it also for a branch store. You remember, you remember how the uh, the town of Maynard was stippled with private stores all around town. There were dozens of them in every neighborhood, uh, usually ethnic stores, Polish, Russian, Finnish, whatever. Uh, and uh, so it was not it was not a strange thought to have a co-op on Main Street and to have a a branch over on Powder Mill Road, which was not very far away. But uh, that's what they did. Uh, the bakery was an immediate success, and uh, it continued then from, from that point on for years to come. Uh, there's a, such a thing as a main cooperative milk association. That was a lot of the Finnish milk farmers, uh, dairy farmers in the area, had pooled, uh, uh, pooled their resources and they put up a very humble building on Bates Avenue. Uh, there's a picture of that building somewhere in here, and when you look at it, it looks like uh, somebody's uh, chicken coop or, or, or what might be a, a play, play building for some kids or something. It's a very, very humble building, uh, and that was supposedly the beginning of their, uh, of this milk association, Finnish Milk Association. But uh, uh, a couple of years later, the Maynard Co-op invited them to join the, the cooperative and become a, a part of them. Uh, however, these farmers that were distributed all through Stowe and, and all around Maine uh, were not all socialists by any means. And uh, so there were quite a number of them who refused, who refused to join. And so at that time, uh, some of the uh, other groups in Maine got together and at a meeting at the Finnish Congregational Church in 1915, they started another cooperative. Uh, they had uh, 42 members at that ori original meeting, and they decided not to open a store until they had $1,500 in capital, uh, which did not take them very long. Uh, they named, again for the historians of today, unwittingly, their store the First National Cooperative Association. However, the word national does not mean like the first national bank. Uh, nationalism was a, a trend amongst the Finns. The socialists who were driving their, their point of view were opposed by the people in the other groups who, who were more intent on talking about things Finnish and keeping the Finnish culture going, etc. And we would call them nationalistic. So they, they founded this cooperative which they called the first Ensimainen National, they should have said Nationalistic Cooperative Association because, you know, uh, a few years later, we've got a first national cooperative on Main Street and we've got a chain that's known as the first national who's coming in uh, on, on other places in town, you know. 
so it gets to be very confusing. But anyway, they started this store uh, on Main Street uh, in that building that burned down there where Tories was. Uh, they were right there across the street from the other block. Uh, the, but as soon as they got in there, uh, they had a fire there too. Uh, they were able to, to repair the, the damage and so forth. Uh, and they stayed there for four years, and then they bought the building on the corner of Main and River Streets, where the Thai restaurant is now, I think. And uh, at that time, uh, they put up some buildings out back, and they put a bakery and a milk department in there. Uh, and this cooperative flourished for many, many years. Uh, uh, in fact, right up until 1941. So a block apart on Main Street, we have two finished cooperatives. Uh, that we're not speaking to each other. Uh, the, uh, the other one finally went bankrupt in 41, mostly because, they, again, they had extended credit to the point that they were not able to continue on. Uh, there's a very good story on that in this book called The Finnish Imprint, because they wrote it themselves. That's from their point of view. The stories in the books put out by the other co-op are naturally slanted. Uh, so you have to, to read both, both, uh, both uh, stories to get a fair picture. Uh, then the, uh, the co-op that, that was on the main co-op that we're talking about, uh, in their anxiety to advance this cooperative cause, the pioneers at one time experimented with so-called million dollar organization. They took the cooperatives in Maine, at Pittsburgh, Quincy, Norwood, Gardner, and Worcester, and they pooled their capitalization and their properties in 1919, and they set up a general office in Boston after incorporating under the name of the United Cooperative Society of New England. And each society then at that time gave up that lovely Finnish name that they had been using for years and years, and became, Maine's became known as the United Cooperative Society of Maine. Uh, the one in Fitchburg became the United Cooperative Society of Fitchburg, etc. Et uh, when Paul showed me the stuff that we had in the files, we discovered that we had uh, the notes of all the board meetings that were held to establish that million dollar cooperative. I think we have them because the, boards, the meetings were all held in Maynard because Maynard was kind of a central, central spot to all these other cities. And uh, so we have this very, very valuable record of exactly what happened to this million dollar co-op, which was not a success. Uh, they had started a little too late. Uh, they didn't have quite enough money. And uh, then we also got to a little bit of politics coming into it. Uh, let me tell you about this social so socialist society and what happened to them. It had grown enough uh, by 1912 to put up a hall on Parker Street. And you all know what that hall looks like. It's that ugly brown building that's down there on 27th at the lights uh, where 27 starts up the hill towards Sudbury from Pecum Milton. On the left-hand side is a big I say now, ugly brown building. And that was the hall they built. Uh, they built it uh, uh, to, to take care of their membership, which had grown to 300 by this time, uh, in spite of the fact that already in, uh, so up to that time, the IWW, does anybody know what the IWW is? The International Workers of the World, the Wobblies, they used to be called. Uh, Big Bill Haywood was their leader out in the mining states. It was a, a, a part of the socialist movement that be believed in unionism and, and doing things with the union. That was the way to proceed. Uh, and uh, some of these Finnish socialists were wobblies, and they left because they didn't get, get their way through. But uh, the society still continued to grow so that four years later, they had to raise the building and put on a, a basement to it. It was, the hall was originally built almost on ground level, and then it was raised uh, four years later, so that they now had a big hall, uh, well, big, big for them. 250 people could be seated there 
Uh, it had a large stage and all the amenities that go with a pro for dramatic productions. And downstairs they had a cafeteria and all sorts of other rooms for various other activities. And uh, this, this building was rented by people in town. Uh, the, uh, the chairs were loose on the floor, of course. They had held dances there. And they also played basketball in there, and they did calisthenics and gymnastics and that sort of thing. But now, in 1917-18, when the Russian Revolution takes place, Finland, you understand, was the Grand Duchy of Russia up to that point. It was not an independent country. Uh, when the revolution took place, this, this uh, provisional government headed by Lenin granted Finnish Finland independence. And uh, in the, the scurrying about to, to establish a country of itself, the country went through a terrible revolution. Uh, the socialists on one side, the uh, nationalists on the other side, and uh, it was a terrible war. Terrible war with all the bloody consequences of what happens after the war is over. Uh, sort of a civil war comparable to America, where the, the hatreds and, the, and the, the good feelings don't come for many, many, many decades. And so uh, the same thing then happens here in, in Maynard. The socialists in the hall are divided into two groups. When, uh, when the Bolsheviks take over in Russia, a part of the, the, of the group feels they're doing the right thing. And they decide that they want to do, support them. And the other part of the people say, no, 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 we're not supporting that, that part of socialism. We're sticking with what, is, what has then later turned out to be social democrats. And uh, a terrible, terrible rift comes. It comes all over the country in every Finn town where there's a socialist organization. They have a, a, a terrible fight. Here on the East Coast, thanks very much to the editorship of this Finnish newspaper that's in Fitchburg, it's still there. I write for them sometimes. Uh, they led the fight here in the East to keep the communists from getting power. And the communists in Maynard and in most towns around here were voted out of the society. They were the minority. And they went out and they built their own hall. Uh, they walked out and they built a hall on Waltham Street at the top of the rise as you're going to Russo's before you head down the hill on the right-hand side. I don't know if many of you remember it, but there it was. Uh, the socialists kept the property that they had. Now, in addition to the hall, they also had a summer place up at what is now Bosses. Uh, there, they had bought that as a farm, put the farm and the fields around it. They made uh, uh, athletic fields, uh, and they built a great big pavilion that we'll see some pictures of. Uh, and uh, so they were able to keep that property while the, the communists went out and, and built their own hall. It was even a larger facility than the Parker Street Hall. And it was used by the town. Uh, the high school used to put on plays there. The high school basketball teams used to play some of their games there. Uh, the Maynard Lodge of Elks was actually founded at a meeting and held in that building. But in 1932, it burned. Uh, that was quite a fire. I remember it as a very little kid. And uh, of course, the socialists all felt that it was burned on purpose to to get back some of the monies that were invested in it that had been borrowed from individuals. But there's no knowledge of that, really. So that's where the real Marxists were located. And uh, the red flags that so troubled Ken Olson when he uh, was talking to us, uh, he told us that uh, when they bought the Park Street Hall after it had been sold and it was made into a boys club, they found red flags underneath the stage. Uh, <laughs> And I, uh, I tried to tell him that that's very true. Uh, they probably did find red flags there, but they were not kept very well. So they were buried in, in that, uh, in that uh, under that stage for I don't know how long. Uh, and there's a picture here somewhere, well, I'll put it out, of uh, us putting on a play uh, probably in the 40s sometime, one of the great Finnish dramas. And if you look in the picture up on the wall, there are all sorts of, of banners hanging. And th those are those socialist red flags turned backwards 
with uh, uh, with all sorts of things painted on the backside uh, for scenery. So that was that was the that was the extent of the the honor of the red flags that were there. Uh, so his, he was looking in the wrong place for for his uh, for his communists. Uh, as he said, uh, he didn't think that there were any bomb throwers in Maynard, uh, but there were a few card-carrying communists. We found that out during the McCarthy era, if you remember rightly. Uh, also, we had uh, a rather interesting, uh, let's see if I can find this article here. We had a rather interesting uh, thing happen a little bit later on then. Uh, by 1940 when the when the Russians and the Finns were going at each other uh, eight, the newsletter says threatening anonymous letter received by Co-op Society committee protests the removal of a Co-op employee member of the communists and uh, there was one one gentleman who worked at the main Co-op in fact he had been on the board of the directors at one time he had been one of those uh, managers in the early years uh, who had tried to help run the store. Uh, his, ad his name was Adolf Suichpane. Uh And uh, he admitted to being a communist. And uh, uh, I guess he was making so much noise at work about, about the, the Russian-Finnish war, putting the blame on the, the Finns, not the Russians, that uh, they finally fired him. And they received this letter, which was postmarked uh, from the main post office. And uh, it said it came from 20 Powder Mill Road. And it said so forth. We, the members of the Russian International Workers' Order, have at a recent meeting resolved against your action against the Russian people, who are being called barbarians, as if we Russians over here in America are to blame for those measures which the Soviet Russia took against Finland. You will know that the Soviets started proceedings against Finland, and he goes on to, to give his point of view. Uh, you ignore this. You even forced a Finnish man out of his job because he would not uphold the pro-fascist Finnish party over here in Maynard. So he's calling all the rest of the socialists pro-fascists at this point. Uh, we demand that a retraction of this hostility toward the Russian people be made, and the aforementioned man be returned to his position. If steps are not taken to correct these wrongs, we shall be forced to take measures against these repulsive acts, as it will mean that you do not wish to carry on commercial business with the Russian people. And the communication was signed, Committee, uh, and bore a blue seal with BR-3034 Maynard Mass, organized January 1928 on its surface. Uh, they did not retract the statement. Uh, they just uh, ignored it, more or less. I guess they did go to the police, and the uh, police looked, and the, the 20 Powder Mill Road turned out to be the Russian Hall, which is now uh, Ciro's, uh, that building there. And uh, according to officials, the discharge employee is head of the Finnish Communists in Maine. The letter has been handed over for investigation. So that's the kind of stuff that was bubbling around at that time. Uh, my, not, not my family, but the house I live in had a kind of an interesting experience with Adolf Suikkanen. He had uh, ordered some communist propaganda, and uh, instead of having it sent under his name, he had picked a name out of the out of the air, and the name he picked was Signe Nyman, who happened to live on our second floor <coughs> with her husband and daughter, and uh, put his own address down on uh, Florida Road, uh, but her name is the recipient. Well, you know, we heard from the, la the last meeting, the Maynard Police, the Maynard uh, Post Office Department uh, knows everybody in town. So they delivered the, pa the package to Signe Nyman up at our 30 <laughs> 35 Fairfield Street address. And she was very astounded to open it to find it full of this communist propaganda. Uh, she, was <laughs> she, being such a good-hearted lady, was going to return it to him. My mother said, let's burn it in the stove, and I guess that's what they did to him. <laughs> but, so this kind of stuff was going on. Uh, all right, now let's get back to the co-op again. So, the stuff is boiling along, but in 1925, larger quarters were needed for the main store, so an annex was built along River Street. Uh, I don't know if you remember that. It's now been torn down. It went, 
uh, from just behind the, the co-op as it stands now, along River Street up to the, the next house. Uh, and uh, they moved the dairy up there and, and put in a very modern dairy. And there were some garages there. You'll see some pictures of it on the, uh, on the video when we get to it. Uh, that's in 1925. In 1926, they bought a small store on the corner of Parker and, and uh, Waltham, where Murphy and Snyder is now. And uh, they were able to uh, uh, take an, open another branch there, and they shut the one that was over there on the other street. Uh, my back is giving me a little spasm, so I'm not going to bend over and keep looking for these pictures. Uh, I'm going to just put them out at the end of the, the program, and you'll see them. Uh, so that was in 26. Uh, in 1934, they brought the, list, the rest of the land down to the river, and where, where still 24 is now, and they put in a gasoline station, which they had never had before in the co-op. So uh, at this point now, then we have a store, another store, a bakery, a dairy. Uh, there's also a furniture department now, uh, next to the, the store in back, and uh, uh, at at this point, the restaurants are still going up on the second floor, and now they're opening a gas station. So they were really moving along. Uh, they were certainly following the, the rule that says you cannot stand still, you have to keep developing. In uh, 1931, uh, with some of the farmers around who came and said, why, don't, why can't we get grain uh, and uh, things like that around here, through the co-op, they opened a farm supply department. Uh, they had opened a coal yard uh, at the railroad siding there behind Paul's business, behind uh, Dun Oil, yeah, where Dun Oil is uh, now, where the railroad used to come through and, and uh, there was another main uh, coal was down near, near the river and they both had, uh, the trestle went over the river and the, the train went by and they, they had uh, the facilities for getting coal and, and grain and so forth. So they have this stuff going. Uh, then when oil becomes, fuel oil becomes a, a, a thing that uh, is up and coming, uh, they start a fuel oil department. And then in 1934, they add one more thing, ice. They're delivering ice as well. So they're trying to give them anything that the consumer needed was there. Uh, then that little store that they had bought down there where Murphy and Snyder is now, in 1936 they decided that it was the time to, to really do something to it, so they tear it down. Uh, temporarily they open across the street uh, while they're, they're putting up a brand new building there, and uh, they open up a, a really nice branch store which had a meat department, groceries, bakery counters, and a very popular luncheon counter that went down the right hand side. and that. On the wall behind the luncheon counter, there was a, a great big sign, and that lighted thing that we got from Florida was a part of it. Uh, and so that is moving along. Uh, and in order to celebrate that particular event, there is such a thing as the Cooperative League of America. Uh, cooperatives have been growing in America through all these years. There's all sorts of co-ops, there's uh, producer co-ops, uh, if you knew the name, if you knew the name, uh, uh, Welsh's Welsh's was a, a, a fruit co-op. Uh, the, the cranberry one, Ocean Spray, was a it is still a, a cooperative. Uh, uh, Land O'Lakes Butter was one of the most famous of the big cooperatives. So there were cooperatives all around. There were also credit unions growing all around, uh, and uh, still in existence. And these were all a part of the Cooperative League of America. And so for that year, in 1936, they decide to have their convention in Maynard. So Maynard celebrates the opening of that store by having a two-day festival. And uh, we've got information on that that you will see also, uh, if you're interested in looking. They start something called Co-op Clubs. They have young people who, uh, who uh, are out of high school and uh, have nothing to do. It's the Depression time. And so they start co-op clubs in all the towns where there are co-ops. And pretty soon these people are going ahead uh, doing all sorts of things, uh, putting on plays, putting on festivals, putting on whist parties, doing all sorts of things. And uh, uh, we've got a few programs from their, their activities. 
they also had a convention here in Maynard, which was very interesting. Uh, now, at this time in history, uh, Mr. Niemela decides that he's had enough of Maynard because he's offered a very fine job with the cooperatives in the TVA project down there in the, in the south. And uh, so a gentleman named Avo Rivers comes in from the Midwest. He had had some experience, and uh, uh, he comes and he stays here for many, many, many years until his retirement, probably 30 years, I guess. Uh, and he continues the good job that, that uh, the other guy has been doing. In 1941, they remodeled the, the main store again, and uh, they made it into the first modern supermarket in the town of Maynard. Uh, up until that point, you know, you remember you went into the grocery store and, and people were waited on you, and if they wanted this, they got it off the shelf behind you. You had always one man waiting on you. Uh, and uh, so back then, in 41, they decided to, to start a supermarket where you can go and pick the things off the shelf yourself and put it into a basket and, and pay at the end. Uh, doesn't seem that long ago. I, I thought I thought that supermarkets had come in before that, but I guess not. Uh, also, at this time, they started a branch store in the city of Worcester. Even though Worcester had had a co-op earlier, it had failed, and and the people there were anxious to to start one again, but didn't have the finances for it. So they opened one in in Worcester that lasts for 17 years. It was never really a big success, but nevertheless it was there. So, how did this cooperative society succeed where so many others in various twin towns have fallen by the wayside? I think it was the aforementioned socialist caretaking in the early years, and then in later life, life according to the Rochdale principles. Uh, and they also started to seek out and not call themselves a fin co-op, but to try to get people from all over town uh, pictures of the boards of directors show that a change was made early to include first the, the second English-speaking generation. Uh, the co-op clubs brought in people uh, because these young Finns had started to intermarry with other nationalities. Uh, the annual meetings were held in Finnish at first, but they were changed to bilingual as soon as possible, and finally to English completely, and they were tried to be moved out of, out of the Finnish uh, the buildings that were considered finished. Uh, they were all used to take place at Pocket Street Hall, but after a while they began to feel that we ought to extend ourselves away from the Finns, and so they'd go to the school school halls, Green Meadow School. Uh, they met at the Congregational Church Hall, uh, etc. Uh, so the, well, I, can, I must say, I was there during those bilingual meetings, and that that took for some patience on everybody's part because everything that was said in Finnish had to be translated into English. And then if the guy in English had to make a response, it had to be translated back into Finnish. <laughs> and those things went on for hours, absolutely for hours. And, and at one point, I was the guy who was trying to do the translation. So why did it all end? I don't know really what to say. Everybody has their own verdicts on why, why the co-ops were gone. And it's not just that the main co-op failed and is gone. Uh, the co-ops in every town are gone, with two exceptions that I know of at this point. Uh, in the 30s, in addition to all these fin co-ops that were in existence, the, the liberals, shall I say, in many of the school towns got the cooperative buck and started cooperatives in their own, own towns. We used to call them the Egghead Cooperatives. There was one in Andover, from the people that work at Andover Newton. Uh, there was uh, one in uh, uh, Putney, Vermont, people that worked at Putney School. There was one up in uh, uh, New Hampshire, uh, where the, where, uh, where the uh, what's, what's the university up there? Dartmouth, where Dartmouth is. Uh, and, uh, these, these cooperatives uh, have kept going even though everything around them has, has fallen. Uh, the one up in Hanover, New Hampshire, at Dartmouth, is still in existence. Uh, there were also other cooperatives uh, founded by other nationalities. We found a picture of a cooperative uh, with, a, with a 
obviously a group of directors in front of it, and we couldn't figure out where it possibly was, but now after we look through some, some stuff that we had here, we discover it was in Lawrence, Mass. Uh, we had a cooperative in Stamford Springs, Connecticut, that was started by the Italians uh, as a meat house. They make a sausage and uh, then extended it into a cooperative. And I understood just, I heard just the other day that that one is still in existence too. So, I think it end, they ended because they're just too small a drop in the sea of American capitalism. They didn't have any influence on the way things were done in this country like they did uh, in Scandinavia. Uh, some departments ended because their time had come. Well, we weren't selling ice anymore, we weren't selling coal anymore, we weren't selling the restaurant anymore. So those departments went, but other departments uh, ran on right until the end. Uh, the oil department ran on until the, they, they stopped the society and, and Dunn bought it. And uh, that's where we got this videotape. Uh, along with the buildings he got, he got what was in them. And there must have been a pile of films in, in one of his garages, which he fortunately put on videotape. And so we're going to have a chance to look at that in a minute. Uh, the, da the dairy ended because of the, the mammoth milk firms that came into power. Uh, like all the other dairies, Ericsson's, Maplecrest, they're all gone. But for its time, Maynard was a shining of example of what could be done in the consumer cooperative movement. We, uh, we were visited by all sorts of interested observers from all over the country. Uh, there was one man who worked here as a, as a uh, public relations director for a while, uh, and then went on to become the head of Consumers Union down there, the, the one the union that puts out the magazine that tells you whether stuff is good or not. Uh, every October, which was considered to be cooperative month, uh, they celebrated with noted speakers who would come to Maine and happily to uh, look into the, the situation here and try to figure it out. Hundreds of young members were sent off to institutes every summer. Uh, I remember being at one at the University of Massachusetts. I went to Wellesley College one year. I went to Bard College one year. And uh, it was due to one, one, one of these seminars, which was held down in Williamsport. Uh, I was able to have breakfast <coughs> with Esther Peterson, who was at that time uh, President Kennedy's consumer advocate. You remember, she was the one who, who worked so hard to, to uh, get fair labeling on, on canned goods, etc. And then another time, uh, one summer, we ha had the chance to shake the hands of Eleanor Roosevelt when she drove up from her home to speak to the Co-op Institute in a little college that was uh, up the river from uh, Hyde Park. And what happened to the socialists that we left back there? Uh, they marched and they listened to lectures for over 30 years. They made their demands and saw most of them answered in the coming of FDR and his, his uh, his laws on uh, eight-hour day and children, children's labor and, and social security and all this sort of things. That's the things that they had been talking about for all that time. So by 1940, they simply uh, forgave, for, forwent socialism. They gave it up and they formed the Finnish American League for Democracy, for which, in, for which they worked for 30 years. Uh, mostly, <laughs> they mostly worked to keep up the expenses of paying the taxes on Parker Street Hall. Uh, you know, they had card parties and they, they had concerts and things. And then along came the young people from the war. And uh, do you think they wanted to join a socialist club? No, they were interested in keeping the Finnish heritage going. So they started something called the All-American Club, uh, which was in existence for 35 years or so, uh, which did nothing at the beginning except spread Finnish culture, we had Finnish choruses, we had Finnish theatricals, we had Finnish everything. Uh, and only in later years after the Finnish part of the audience died away and ended up at Glenwood Cemetery, uh, they turned to other, other activities. Uh, and uh, after the hall was sold in 1973, I think, uh, or 70, I guess it was, uh, they, uh, uh, moved to, up to uh, the Italian social club up on uh, Waltham Street, and they were there for a few years until they were also uh, out of the picture. So from 
1979, when it all ended, uh, the Finnish culture was really being pushed all around, and uh, uh, that's what they all ended up being. Uh, that's about the story. I'm going to ask Paul to put this thing on. This is a, a tape that was made of the 40th anniversary of the co-op in 1947. So you'll see some interesting cars, some interesting clothes. <laughs> uh, I don't know if everybody's going to see it. <laughs> yeah, uh, we might show it again uh, after we get through uh, and people move around. We might show it a second time and aim it at another group or something. All right, let's try and see what happens. Yeah. 